Dr. Wong, who specializes in pediatric neurology at Children's Hospital. He earned his medical degree from the University of Panama Medical School in Panama City and completed his residency at Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York. He then completed a pediatric neurology fellowship at Einstein College of Medicine. With more than 21 years experience in pediatric neurology, um, Dr. Wong is here to talk to you today about research updates in neuromuscular care. So Dr. Wong, I'll let you go ahead and, and do your talk. Dr. Romero, who I known over time. Uh, I did not make any slides and Dr. Romero covered some of what I was thinking of covering um, okay, so if you're on the phone, don't worry, you're not gonna miss any anything here. Um, the The topic is research updates. How do we get to that? Is uh, when, like Dr. Romero says, when you come to the meetings, part of my my uh, closing remarks is that. Okay, we have this, this is cooking. I went to the meeting or I found this article and this is what's going on. Now in the, for neuromuscular, neuromuscular disorders, the research is mostly focused on the two common ones, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and spinal muscular atrophy that Dr. Romero covered already. If you were here from in the last hour, uh, I'll go and start with uh, spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, spinal muscular atrophy was, there was two types. The baby type was used to be called Werner Hoffman and the older kids, the juvenile type was called Kugelblatt Wielander. You may hear some older doctors in your clinic refer to it that way. What happened was they, we didn't know the gene. All the diagnosis was doing a muscle biopsy and sometimes fairly nerve conductions. Then we found a gene. How do we fix the gene? It took a while. My professor where I trained kept telling the patients, we know the genes for these disorders. I hope in my lifetime we'll find the cure. Now we have a cure actually, and Dr. Romero mentioned that uh, about Solgensma. Um, now, um, Solgensma is made by a Vexus. I think the water to cover it is a brand new GRT or gene replacement therapy. And what it does, it fixes the SMN1 gene. So it's a one time IV treatment. Now, the problem with that is that in some patients, the liver enzymes go way up more than, uh, more than two times normal. Uh, in my group, one patient received that uh, a month, almost two months ago. He seems as way went high, so they have to treat him with a prednisone, or prednisolone, the liquid form. He has a feeding tube. Um, so that was based on a on a study that was done. Uh, the lead guy was uh, I forgot Rich Finkler's. It's a consortium around the country. They have very detailed ways to, to look at these kids. They have to have the, the confirmatory gene test for these babies, and the earlier the better. Now, the, the new data that happened this year was presented at the SMA meeting that was supposed to happen on, the first, on March 21st in Orlando, Florida. That was canceled because of coronavirus. So we had a few hours of uh, uh, tele teleconference via Ring Central, which is what we're using now. Uh, what was presented was presented in a subsequent meeting in June 2020. I'm sure maybe some of you who have patients, kids uh, with SMA type 1 or type 2 attended that. Uh, the, now, going back to the type 1, type 2, and type 3, so we're on the same page. That was, uh, they were using a functional uh, ability. If the babies were able to sit up, 
or the babies who were not able to sit up. The ones who were able to sit up were called type two. The ones who were not able were type one, that's the most severe. So with that uh, separation, then they were able to find the gene. The type ones are most common, about 60%. Type twos are about 20% of all the SMAs. And type threes are the ones who were able to stand up and walk, but got weaker over time. Now the demarcation is not that clear. We've seen kids who are, I would say, uh, type 1.5. So he's not that weak, but he's he's weaker than type two. So it's not that the type one stops here and type uh, two starts here. So once they had the demarcation, they had to devise a way to study them. They got these acronyms: CHOP in ten is the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia C H O P in ten is the um, abbreviation for the test. Uh, and it's done by therapists that have the outline for that. Intent means infant test of neuromuscular disorders. Over in the in the UK, United Kingdom, there's a, a test called the HINE, H-I-N-E. Uh, that's interesting, call it HINE. Hammersmith, Infant Neurological Examination, H-I-N-E. Hammersmith is a neuromuscular center. That was the location of the preeminent neuromuscular doctor, Dr. Victor Dubowitz, who passed away. Uh, and now it's run by Dr. Montoni, I think. So they devised this testing. So they put these kids through this test. The, um, and they see if they got better. They make endpoints. Okay, so for the, the, the Zolgensma, is the long term, the long term is the long name is Onasemnogen Uh One time IV, I told you about the liver enzymes, is gene replacement therapy or GRT. They use a uh, adenovirus associated serotype nine, AAV9 vector. Um, they were looking for two doses. So we know it worked. The, F, the Food and Drug Administration approved it uh, in May of last year. So the new things going on then, going back to the new test, okay. They call it open label, single arm, phase three means patients, 22 patients, 91% who had type one SMA, who were treated before they made six months old, uh, survived. So 91%, 20 out of 22. And 82% were free of ventilatory support by one and a half years old or 18 months. About 59%, so 13 of the 22 were sitting independently, meaning without support for 30 seconds. That was the benchmark at age 18 months. And then there was another study, open label means that everybody knows what they're getting. Um, Multicenters phase three study, they call it pre-symptomatic. So that means uh, they did not have obvious weakness. Uh, they had the, but these were type two and type three SMA. So meaning they had a two or uh, yeah, they had about three copies or two copies of SMN2 protein. So they were given this before they made six weeks old, before they make a month and a half. All of them survived, 100% of the, of the patients that received this. Um, they did not need to be put on the ventilator. So this is a, a very good because you know babies who were had SMA, the severe form, they either died or ended up uh, with respiratory failure requiring ventilatory support. The children who had two copies of SMN2 were reaching their motor milestones. Um, for example, um, 57%, eight out of the 14, were sitting 
without support, you'll be sitting independently for 30 seconds or more. And 29% were walking. So four out of the 14 were walking by themselves without holding on or anything, independently walking. Now the kids who had three copies of SMN2 were also reaching their milestones, mortal milestones, age appropriate. 27%, uh, that's four out of 15, were standing by themselves independently. And 20%, that means three out of 15, 20% were walking independently. Uh, the other thing that we're looking at is as swallowing. So none of the kids that received this um, Solgensma in the study ended up having a feeding tube. And they looking at, looking at the weight, they were in the normal weight because a lot of the patients who have trouble swallowing and feeding end up being quite underweight. Now, the kids who could sit uh, for more than 10 seconds, but could not walk or stand. That was a phase one slash two trial of uh, Zolgensma or on a similar gene. Uh, these kids were uh, from six months old to five years old. They had three copies of SMN2. So in this study, they received the Zolgensma in the spine meaning intrathecally, which means a spinal tap, instead of intravenously. So that was, I think the lead doctor was Dr. Richard Finkel. Uh, the analysis was done in uh, the interim, so uh, before finishing the study. Uh, December 2019 was presented at the MDA meeting and another meeting in June, uh, I guess to, via uh, video meetings. All the kids were alive. Uh, no, the safety issues, nothing new besides the liver enzyme elevation. Uh, so the changes were statistically significant, meaning that they were not explained just by, by chance and they were clinically meaningful, which means that they were doing more in the, in the Hammers. They have another test device for the Hammersmith called Hammersmith functional motor scale expanded. Um, this is compared to the natural history, history of patients, the same age, age two to two years to five years old. Um, now the thing is this, according to this, this uh, source, I have the study was on hold because there were some, in the animal studies, they saw some toxicity to part of the the sensory nerve uh, is called the, it's a ganglion called the dorsal root ganglion. So they're trying to hold up on that and, and verify that before they go ahead with the humans, more human studies. So that's what we have for SMA, for uh, the Solgensma. I'm not sure if any of the attendees or the families or they know somebody who with type 1 SMA who received uh, Solgensma and if they've seen some results. Now you heard about uh, Nusinersen, which is Pinrasa is made by, by Biogen and Solgensma is uh, made by, uh, I, uh, I think Ionis or PTC and, and Genentech. Genentech has been around for a long time. They've been, they were started with growth hormone way, way back 20 years ago. Um, now, uh, you heard about the RISD plan, which just was approved two weeks ago. It's called a RISD. Uh, it's an oral form. It comes as a powder. It's not cheap. You have to add purified water. That means, I guess, bottled water, not the tap water. Reconstituted. There's some specific handling issues with the, with the RISD or RISD plan. It's for SMA. Uh, to from two was it two months to adults? We haven't had any, but the information they have the dosing by weight, and it works by increasing your SMN two. Uh, 
um, similar to what you get with this with the nucinersin or spinrasa. So this is an oral treatment. Um, so they had uh, in the studies they had uh, patients who had fever. It was short time fever. Uh, diarrhea and a rash was rare and even very rare was uh, you break out in your mouth and you treat that S very smaller number would have like a joint pains and a blood infection uh, but that's rare also uh, the the company that did this had multiple studies done on, on um, they they had the name snapfish firefish uh, Etc. So, is this some specific uses of this Rizaplan um, or Evristi? Uh, you have to be exact in how much water you put in. It's a powder, so you have to uh, make sure it's, it's capped. And then there's a syringe they give you. You put a cap and you keep it in the fridge, just like some of the kids get uh, carbidilol kept in the fridge. You give it at the same time every day. Uh, if you miss it, most of the times you'll be waiting till the next day to give it. Uh, but apparently, it's, uh, the only if you're getting metformin, then you don't get the risk. So this is for everybody, even adult patients. Now they do want you to confirm that they have SMA. Now for the older kids. Um, when the paper charts were converted to electronic, some of you all may not have your, your original gene test confirming that you have SMA, what type of SMA you have. So that may be a, a practical problem. Um, any questions so far on SMA? All right. The other common disease is Duchenne muscle dystrophy. Uh, Dr. Romero touched on that already. It happens in one in about 5,000 boys. It's X-linked. Um, some of the moms of, my, of our patients are carriers. Some carriers express the disease. You have to watch out for that. Uh, so the oldest therapy we have was a corticosteroids. Dr. Romero touched on that. That's even 46 years ago, it turns out. Uh, the University of Rochester, New York, were the first ones. They noticed that there was some inflammation in the muscle biopsies. That's before we found the gene even. So they did more kids, and then more and more, they found it helped. Uh, before doing all this, they had to do um, what they call natural history. So this is different than um, than the patient, say, for example, uh, with a lesion like a cancer or an infection. You treat it for a short time, and then you see the results right away. This one, you have to treat them for a long time. Um, so they were looking at if the kids get walking. So one was to prolong ambulation, right? You all heard that. Usually kids start walking by, say, 12 years old. But I've seen kids start, walk, get, start getting weaker by 9, 10, or 11 years old. Um, the spine surgeons say kids on steroids, um, the, the progression of the curve, the side curve, is not as bad. So it, it postpones scoliosis uh, surgery. And also the lung specialists say you, it keeps your lung muscles stronger, your intercostals, that's the muscles that move your cage rib, your rib cage and the diaphragm stay strong. So you, you don't end up getting this uh, problem with nocturnal hypoventilation. So those are the kids that come in and get an overnight uh, sleep study, determine you're not breathing well at night while you're sleeping, they put a CPAP and BiPAP on you. But the problem, uh, I'm in Louisiana, New Orleans, uh, 
And we see a lot of weight gain. I'm sure they see some in Shreveport. Um, muscle weakness, lack of activity, preference for video games. Uh, who knows? Uh, so it's, it's very discouraging to see weight gain. Um, the optimal dose is by body weight. Thin and then we want to, to get the, the, the results. Uh, over in, uh, I think Dubowitz did a study, they did 10 days on, 10 days off. We tried that, uh, we didn't see any, any help. And then probably 10 or 15 years ago, Dr. Ann Connolly in Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, tried giving the whole week, weekly dose in two days on the weekends. We can high dose or we can dosing. And they found that there was a bit less weight gain. Uh, the only thing was stomach upset and the, some kids were cranky on the weekend. But come Monday, they were back to themselves. And they found that it was like a pulsing, pulse steroids. Now, the other thing that in the, um, so when do you give a steroids? That's still a debate. Uh, some people were saying 10 years ago, give it during that quote unquote crisis period when the kids are, are falling more and they're getting more difficulty standing up. You know, when you come to clinic that we ask you to sit, sit on the floor and get up, you should be lay flat uh, on the floor and get up. But um, in the studies now, it's called time to stand. Uh, so when this, they're having more trouble, getting up that when was offered now the question is because you're born with this and you see the weakness say when you're three two three four five years old slow getting up so offering the steroids for younger kids so there was a study published um by this group or multi-center study i think came out last year uh, offering this treatment for little kids uh, who are still walking. Uh, we haven't done that in our group. The problem is how do they take it because the pill, they cannot swallow the pills. The oral penicillin is kind of orangey looking. It's very, I heard this, the taste is very nasty. Um, so that needs to be figured out. I don't think there's a final the, um The other steroid that came, that was in use in Europe for many years, and many of you have heard about this, is the Flasacort. The Flasacort uh, was uh, studied in the U.S. by the people in the University of Rochester. They never finished a study. Uh, I think Marathon Pharmaceuticals picked up on that. They finished the studies, put it through the FDA, and it was approved. The advantage of the Flasacort, I think in Canada, it's called Calcort. Some of you were purchasing it from the U.K. United Kingdom or from Canada uh, is less weight gain. Uh, less weight gain. Hold on. There's a person here. Okay, we get to the CMD. Uh -huh. Okay. In less weight gain, uh, they say reduce height velocity means that you, you don't get as tall as you're supposed to be. In our case, the in the U.S., the kids who were in a wheelchair are early on, so we don't see that. So it's not um, not a big one here. Cataracts are rare with oral steroids, long-term oral steroids. So apparently with this, it's a little bit more than with prednisone. I've only seen cataracts so once in a boy with myasthenia. It's a little dot right in the middle of your eye. It's not the cataract you get when you're adults or uh, order conditions. The other cataracts is more like a like a curtain coming over your eyes. Um, so that's the flasacord. Um, it's given every day. Uh, they haven't studied the weekend dose with the flasacord. Uh, was it superior to prednisone? No, no big superiority. Okay, let me see what. It Compared with prednisone, it's a slightly higher muscle strength. So way back, that places like a C synergy, I think it's called CIA or CNRG in Washington DC. 
they were using ergometer, meaning you were checking your muscle strength. They had machines that check your muscle strength so you really have accurate measurements. Uh, the flat support, the goal again is to that you keep walking longer. So if your patient's walking longer as opposed to ending up in a wheelchair, if you're walking for another year or two years, that's a big plus. Because you imagine going to school and getting put in the wheelchair early on or versus getting put in the wheelchair um, uh, in another one or two years. Okay. Um, now the new thing is Vamorolone, V-A-M-O-R-O-L-O-N-E. It's a synthetic steroid. They change a the molecule. Their lead person in this is Dr. Eric Hoffman. There, he's a PhD. He was the one who, one of the US who found the, helped find the gene for, uh, for the gen. Um, now, Vamor alone is still under studies. We don't have a final in that. Um, let's see. Multi center study. There was, there was supposed to be presented at the American Academy of Neurology meeting. The AAN was in Toronto in the uh, end of April, but that was canceled because of the coronavirus. I think usually it's about 10,000 neurology doctors, you know, bone disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, Parkinson uh, topics. So they had an open label study. Uh, they give it every day, two milligrams, Per kilogram per day and the higher dose six milligrams per kilogram per day and the study suggested uh, possible efficacy in a 24 week study that means uh, uh, six months so they had 48 boys who went to a phase 2a trial so that was safety it was safe it didn't at the dose of two milligrams per kilogram per day, significantly improved muscle function. They look at the test called time to stand. See, normally you and I can pop up from the floor in two seconds. Uh, and that normal test of uh, the Gower's test is anybody take longer than four seconds standing up from, from sitting on the floor. Uh, that's a uh, positive for normal Gower test. So um, in preclinical, meaning before using on patients, again, the steroids had uh, anti-inflammatory. So they reduce the inflammatory response when your muscle breaks down in, with the dystrophin. There was reduced adverse effects compared to prednisone. Now the, at the molecular level, it has uh, effects that they knew um, it works on a different ligand receptor complex compared to their regular one in prednisone. So the boys were aged four years old to uh, up to seven. They, they were never treated with steroids. There were different doses. Uh, they ended up with a two mix, two milligrams per kilogram per day and six milligrams per kilogram per day. They had a lower dosing for safety, 0, 0 0.25 milligrams per kilogram per day and 0 0.75 milligrams per kilogram per day. So they had 12 uh, boys with Duchenne in each uh, level. And it was given as an oral suspension. Suspension means it's settled, so you need to shake it uh, every time you give it. And it's time to stand, oh, from supine. Supine means laying on your back. The secondary uh, outcome measure, meaning what they were looking at is how long they walk on, in six minutes. It's a six minute walk test. This test was devised a few years ago by Dr. Craig, Mac Craig McDonald at uh, UC Sacramento, or UC Davis in Sacramento. Now steroids, what they do is they, your body makes steroids. So if you give it in the morning, this simulates your body steroids. So that suppresses your, the function of your adrenal gland, the little gland on top of your kidneys. 
so there was evidence that there was uh, a small number of boys who had some adrenal suppression. So they have to uh, do more studies and measure this, this um, hormone level. Uh, so there's ongoing, they call it double blind. So the patient don't know what they're getting. The doctor prescribing don't know who's getting it. Only somebody in the pharmacy knows patient number X is getting this medicine or, or placebo. Uh, so that's cooking. It's exciting because you don't have to wake in, which is a problem again in the patients that we see in our clinic. Um, now, Dr. Romero also talked about other ways to treat uh, Duchenne, which is the exon skipping. So she mentioned that exondus help about 13% uh, about of patients with exon that were amenable to exon 1551 skipping. And uh, it's called ethoplerosin. The lead author back then was doc, uh, Dr. Jerry Mandel. They had to do studies back and forth for that to get it approved by the FDA. And it was approved. It's every week you get IV medicine. Uh, it's not medicine, it's not a pharmaceutical, it's biotechnology, I think they call it. It's made by Sarepta in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, so that opened the door for treatments um, because this is a very not new form. What it does, it increased the level of dystrophin on the follow-up muscle biopsies at six months and 12 months, about 0.9%. So that little bit increase in dystrophin was enough to make the kids <coughs> do more, excuse me, more like a becker. Becker is a rare form of, of muscle dystrophy with deficient dystrophin, but they keep some dystrophin. It's not completely absent, so they keep walking longer. Way back, we had two boys, two brothers with Beckers, and they kept walking until about 16, about 16 years old, before they ended up in a wheelchair. So it's, to me, it was like a holy grail when we heard that this thing increased dystrophin. So when the FDA approved that technology, it opened the door for more. So the same company, Sarepta, came up with the uh, Golo Duracin, right? Dr. Romero mentioned that. Um, and that's for Exxon, uh, all these numbers, 53. Now, interestingly, uh, there was a product called Suvor Beerson that didn't do anything. They didn't reduce the level of uh, muscle enzyme. The kid did not get stronger. And that was presented at the MDA uh, video meeting back in March. Uh, so it's good that we, we also learned that not everything is hunky-dory, that sometimes it doesn't work. They don't know why it didn't work. So they're going back to, to review that Suvo, Suvo Derson. Now the problem with, the, with Exondus 51 is that it doesn't help the heart muscle. So they, the Sarepta came up with a peptide modifier. And that showed um, in the studies that it helps the heart muscle. So that's being studied on, a, on phase trials. So yeah, Golodurson is it helps the patients with exon forty-five. This Casimersen, exon fifty-three, about eight percent of patients. So the percentage of that, the big gene. The problem with the big gene is that the multiple parts of the gene can be affected, can be missing. So how is there's no one treatment for all of them? So for the 13% of kids who are amenable to exon 51, you give exondus, but it doesn't help the heart. But 8% of kids who have exon 45, you can, they can get golodirsin, which is actually is, is thing is biondis, right? Dr. Romero mentioned that. Uh, and casimersin is for exon 53. Uh, this Vito, 
Bill to Larson, excellent 45. That's still, and it increases the dystrophin to about 5.7%, which is more than the other ones. Now, the last thing would be uh, micro dystrophin. Micro dystrophin, um, they've been talking about this uh, at our national meetings. That was, I think, October of last year. Uh, Dr. Mendel was a lead, he's a lead author. So the dystrophin gene is so big, there's realistically no way of, of fixing that gene. So they came up with this idea to at least give a modified dystrophin gene, uh, genetic, genetically modified, that would provide the key parts, the key, the, the essential components so that the muscle can function. Um, they had four boys, one dose IV or microdystrophin. After three months, the gene expression, meaning that this, the gene expressed this gene product dystrophin, levels were 95.8%. Uh, well, these are the kids who were already have Duchenne muscle dystrophy. So they had uh, fibrosis, which is scar tissue or fat tissue. Uh, and the muscle enzyme that was the CK, that's the blood test you do, the total CK. The levels were reduced. So the CK levels are high, say 10,000, 20,000 in the patients. You heard the numbers in your kids. That comes up because the muscle membrane is, is, it doesn't, doesn't work. So the enzymes come out. Um, so that's exciting, but that's still on the, on the on trials, so we don't know much more about that. So we'll see how that comes out. So it's a big promise with this. Um, any questions so far? I have see a person in the chat. Okay, uh, we'll get to that. Yeah, we can ask that at the end. Okay. Uh, there's mention of antioxidants. There's a geneticist in my city uh, who gives, uh, so this people giving antioxidants, that's coenzyme Q, coenzyme Q10, and the other one is idebenone, um, think that it helps the muscle function. Uh, there's, with some of the kids, they because they're sitting all day long, the way you put, you make your bone stronger is by calcium. And then how you do that is by you and I are standing and walking. But the kids who are sitting there all day in the wheelchair or not walking and they're taking steroids, steroids can make the, your bones weaker. So they can get fractures, especially the big bones like a femur bone. That's the biggest bone in your body. Uh, to keep the bone health, uh, we look for the bone scan called DEXA, D-E-X-A. Then if it's less than two standard deviations, then um, you do something. We, did, we had a, a rehab doctor, PMNR, P, Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, who had a small study giving um, IV medicine, IV hamidronate, that's intravenous, and the oral form is the Fosamax. You see this lady, on this actress on TV, uh, talking about but what's actually you need to take it standing up you have to wait so much so it, it's hard on the kids who are not able to stand up uh, so there's evidence to give uh, vitamin d3 d3 is over the counter 1000 to 4000 units a day and calcium calcium supplements are usually uh, either 1000 or, or more of calcium that would be like a tums. I've only had one or two little kids who don't like the chalky taste of that, so I'm not sure what else you can give. Uh, for the heart, historically, we had a, a, a pediatric cardiologist, he just retired, he was giving the joxin and Lasix. But now they're talking more about this class of uh, cardiac muscle medicine called ACE inhibitors. They'll be like uh, your lisinopril and similar. So for those, they want now they're talking about giving it early. 
So they have this thing called ejection fraction. When they check your, your heart muscle, they put the probe to your chest. Um, no complaints. So they had a study in kids eight, nine to 13 years old who were still having good cardiac function with a good ejection fraction. They were giving Perindopro, uh, 28 kids, uh, compared to placebo. And they had a higher 10 year survival rate. Um, say 93% survived when compared to 65.5% survival. So the, based on that, the, um, the recommendation from this study was to start this ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker before two years, 10 years old. I don't think that's translated to all the cardiologists that see our kids. Um, uh, there, are, there was another study, but I haven't seen it in print. We had three of our my, uh, campers were going to the University of Florida for this subcutaneous injection. You do it once a week in the belly fat, like you, know, you pinch the kid's belly, and it's the myostatin inhibitor. I heard that didn't pan out. The goal of that was to, there's something normally that uh, prevents your muscle from growing. If you give this this thing that inhibits this myostatin, then your muscles will grow. Uh, I remember the animal studies, uh, that was pre-Katrina, maybe 15 years ago, in one of the national NDA meetings. Uh, Dr. Anthony something presented the rat. They were giving myostatin inhibitor and this, it's like you skin the rat, you show all the muscles. It, it, to me, it looked like Maddie Mouse, huge muscles, but that didn't pan out in the kids I've, I've been told on the patients. So the Holy Grail picks a dystrophin gene. Uh, for now, we have the oral steroids, and there's still evidence that it works better. Uh, weight gain is a big problem. Less weight gain if you give it on the weekends. The hope is that you keep walking longer. There's the plaza cord. By the way, the Warren Plaza is a huge pill. I'm not sure how the kids follow that. And then Vamorolone is the oral, the other steroid that's still in, in trials that doesn't have the weight gain. And the, I think the osteoporosis, they don't see that, those, those side effects. Bone health, position. Okay. Now, I have some minutes to I'll talk about congenital muscle dystrophies. Thank you for that question. Velis, uh, Ms. Velis. Uh, are you there, Velis? Uh -huh. So congenital muscle dystrophies, we're talking more about that. Um, way back, all we knew was the Fukuyama type, Yuki Fukuyama in Japan, that's the most common type of congenital muscular dystrophy. But the kids are have, in the brain scan, they have a congenital brain malformation or migration disorder. They get polymicrogyria, they get seizures, they get intellectual disability, and they have muscle weakness. And they found that causes a, a protein called fucutin. Now, historically, we knew there was a, um, another type of congenital muscular dystrophy. That means really weak and floppy babies. They would, um, the insides were high, the biopsy showed the dystrophic pattern, but it was, the dystrophy was fine. It was other parts that were missing. So one was a myrosin, M-E-R-O-S-I-N. So that's the second type. It don't affect the cognition, meaning they're mentally fine. Uh, then there was another type called muscle eye brain disease, or MEB. There was one was Santabori, uh, so the muscle, yes, yeah, the dystrophic muscles, eye, they had uh, small eyes or a, a missing piece on the iris, which is the ring. The iris is the color of your eyes. And the brain could have some thick uh, brain called pachygyria or polymicrogyria, and they had seizures and mental retardation. Uh, but now, for the last uh, at least five years, the lead person in this is Dr. Karsten with a C, Bonneman, two N's. Uh, he's at the NIH, 
he's, I think he's German. He's group, he's found his patients and they were able to look at the muscles and they call it the uh, congenital muscle dystrophy due to col, C-O-L, col 6A or collagen. So collagen is a component of your extra, that, that's a part between your, your, uh, your cells and your tissues. So the, in the extracellular matrix or ECM, it has to do, if it's missing, then you get muscle weakness. Uh, it's the second most common type of congenital muscular dystrophy in Japan after Fukuyama. So we're finding more kids with pol 6 a So that's one type. The severe baby type is Ulrich, U-L-L-R-I-C-H. They have a lot of weakness in babies. And then the older kids, it's very mild. They're not so weak. It's called Bethlehem. Not Bethlehem. Bethlehem is that's in, in uh, Israel. Bethlehem is a German doctor. Um, very mild. And then there's more kids in between that have the pol 6 a there's cold 6A1, cold 6A2, and so on. So thank God there's we can find this via gene test. We have this um, genetic testing, uh, congenital myopathy panel, or congenital neuromuscular panel, a gen testing company called Invite. Then you heard about that later. Uh, that has confirmed. And the other thing uh, they talk about is deep phenotyping, which is looking at the skin. For example, in cold 6 a they can have this kind of sandpapery skin. It's called uh, keratosis pilaris. Uh, uh, let's see. Dr. Wong? Yes. Um, is there any clinical research or an update as far as myotonic is concerned? Uh, hold on. There were some studies. I, didn't have, I don't have the information handy. Uh, all we have is giving something to alleviate the, the stiffness, the myotonia, the muscle stiffness. Uh, now, I w oh, going back to the mental capacities with uh, Duchenne. Now, Duchenne we know is caused by the, this uh, genetic thing that, that you don't have dystrophin. People, we know that dystrophin is, exp is express all over the body, uh, well, not our body, but in different parts of your brains, including your brains. The connection between each brain cell is called the synapse, S-Y-N-A-P-S-E. So people say that a specific mutation can cause uh, more of a mental deficiency. We've known that up to 25% of kids with Duchenne will have trouble focusing. And a small number will most of them will do fine at school and some, but some of them have learning problems, uh, difficulty learning, reading, spelling. Now, does that, ha does, that, does that manifest as autism? Like Dr. Romero said, autism is a behavioral diagnosis. It's problems with their communication, um, and problems with social interaction. So it does not, that's why she said that, you know, we, there's no known association. Now, uh, collagen 6, col 6A, uh, Dr. Bonneman um, is the one, he's had some reviews and congen congenital muscle dystrophies. Um, uh, and that's available online, actually. Um, I'll put his name on the chat, Karsten. Something like that, I think, yeah, Bonneman. If you Google him and Google congenital muscle dystrophies, they'll come out all of us. The other one Dr. Romero was mentioning uh, that we know more about is the RYR1. The geneticists can tell you more about that. That presents the congenital myopathy um, uh, called central core. Uh, and central core can present with muscle weakness. Now the problem with that is that this RYR1 Gene is next is seen in kids who have a reaction to anesthesia to the inhaled anesthetics, the halothane or similar. So we have um, when they get anesthesia with this halothane, uh, 
they have a reaction. The muscles get stiff, the jaw gets stiff, the temperature goes up, and that's and so that's a no-no. Uh, the same with the voice of the shin. Uh, we had kids who came to get tubes in the ears, and then they were undiagnosed because they were still walking and maybe they had the, the big calves, right? The big uh, calf muscles were big. And they had trouble extubating the kids. They had to put them in the ICU. And then we found that they, they boys have to shin. Uh, that's their risk for this and reaction to anesthesia. Um, now, if your kids have muscle weakness, uh, kids with myasthenia, Dr. Romero said also, if they have to do something, don't give them the, the muscle paralyzing agents because that would block the communication between the nerve and the muscle, which is the, which is the, the problem in myasthenia. So I agree with her that she said, um, uh, avoid that. Recently we had one case where here in my center, a kid came and they, they had trouble, so they had to paralyze the kid to put the tube down because the kid uh, was not holding up the oxygen and the carbon was uh, monoxide was was building up. Okay, so well, thank you for listening. Uh, thank I'd be happy you. To questions. Thank you, Dr. Wong. I don't see any other questions that have come through, but yeah, uh, we you. appreciate your time this Saturday. Thank you. Have a great thank rest you. of your day. No, thank you.